All right, welcome back to The Short of It, where we cover everything in the short selling world in under 45 minutes. We got a banger this week. Everyone wants to know about our favorite firm, Archegos. So let's just jump right in. Carson, what are you thinking about this right now? This is a special uh, short of it, um, in part because of the topic, but um, also Dan David is not joining us. Um, He's off on a disciplinary leave because he has decided that he's not going to swear as much uh, starting with his podcast. And so uh, I felt that we needed to give him a timeout, um, you know, let him hopefully, you know, find himself and then rejoin us on the show. Um, so first of all, I don't know how the f- you pronounce the name of that firm, but I think we should just call it Arch Egos. The reason for that is it's unclear how many billion he had, but it was multiple billion, and he decided to lever that five to one. Bill Huang flew a little too close to the sun. By taking on an insatiable amount of risk, he grew his Archegos Capital Management into an investing whale. But when several positions turned against him, it didn't take much to tip his firm into turmoil, causing tens of billions of dollars in forced selling. Now, the risk levels he ran defied logic. I spoke with several hedge fund managers who said they could not fathom that type of tolerance. The Financial Times reported that banks were lending to Archegos at ratios as high as 8 to 1. He has probably taken himself from a lifestyle where he could have easily afforded a fleet of G6s to being relegated to net jets for possibly the rest of his life. And I don't know what would motivate somebody with that much money to run that much insane risk other than massive ego. So I think we start with calling it arch egos. It has made me think about some lifestyle choices I've you know, generally live like reasonably frugally and it it actually did catalyze that I'm probably gonna buy like a, a nice car because I've just decided that if I ever wipe myself out in three days time I want something nice to drive myself off a bridge in. It's mind-blowing to me because I, I keep thinking about this well maybe he's got like a little bit of money tucked away somewhere and then I just think to myself does the kind of person that runs whatever it is, two, three, five times leverage on like that much personal money, think about a rainy day. And I got to wonder if they do, because that is insane. Speaking of which, uh, you guys have crossed paths in a specific stock that they were long. Um, And you had pretty much an antithesis view on the stock as they did. Can you walk through that whole scenario? I really hope a lot more comes out here, but um, so we've been short GSX since middle of last year. And GSX is China, it's online education, and it's a near total fraud. Um, we published extensive research on it. We think at least 70%, probably, you know, more than 80% of the users are fake, uh, that they're just bots and probably 80 to 90 percent plus of the revenue is fake as well. And we weren't the only ones to call this thing a, a fraud. Grizzly, those are guys who used to be geo investing. So they've got credibility in this space. They were the first ones. Then Citron came along, called it a fraud. We called it a fraud. Then JL Warren, uh, which doesn't normally do activist work, it's a uh, subscription research focused on China. Um, and the, uh, the principal there, uh, June Hung Lee, she wrote uh, Tiger Lady on Wall Street. She came out and has repeatedly publicly called it a fraud. Uh, another firm that is based in China, I had never heard of, but did decent research on this called Scorpio VC, also called it a fraud. And I've never been involved in a situation where so many credible researchers have called one company a fraud And the thing is, we all get there through differing methodologies, and we all come to the same conclusion. So you would think that this company would have been, the stock price would have been in the dirt long ago, but that's incorrect. Subsequent to our coming out, this stock more than tripled on us, and it actually became 
you know, everybody talked last year about Wirecard and what a massive fraud that was in terms of market cap. But this GSX actually exceed, exceeded at peak Wirecard's market cap. And I think it did that twice. So what was going on? Well, one of the things that was also unusual about GSX was almost every time we go out and call some something a fraud, right? There is a cacophony of defenders on the other side, you know, saying you misinterpret this, you got that wrong, you ignored this. Um, but you know, with GSX, it was weird. It, you know, the, and usually these defenders, if it's if it's a Chinese company, will come from China. But there just wasn't really an opposite side that I that I discerned being expressed. You know, like it's just such a clear fraud that I think your average Chinese retail investor agrees it's a fraud. But yet it tripled. What was happening? Well, looks like a lot of it was Bill Huang and his arch egos. Um, another was his former protege, Tao Li, and his firm, Tung Yue, and then maybe some others. And Tiger Global was disclosed long. I don't know if that was part of a box or what the deal was, but they tied up enough float. So if you look, the top shareholders outside of, inside, outside of the management um, are all banks. So the banks were holding these positions on swap. And... I think with, when you just add up the swaps, you have almost 70% of the float was choked. Now, there's another player in this also that we shouldn't forget, and that's this guy whose last name is Tian. And Tian runs a fund in Singapore called QQQ. And he's actually good friends with the CEO, the chairman of GSX, Larry Chun. In fact, Tian went to GSX's you know, stand on the balcony at the NYSE and, you know, stroke each other off um, event when uh, GSX went public. Tien has publicly admitted or un admitted on Twitter and then took the posts down that he was a big put seller. And this was one of the things that was that w we realized was causing the squeeze. When we talked to desks over the summer, they said, yeah, big seller of puts in Asia at the money puts. And so buyers of the puts, which were you know, market makers, were putting on deltas and they were buying the stock. And so that was creating this buying. At the same time, a bunch of float had been choked by these swap positions. So if you go back to the interview that I did with Mike Green, when we're talking about how passive creates this upward price convexity by replacing active and choking the float, that's exactly what happened here. And then one more thing that I noted for good measure was um, apparently that uh, that Chinese retail brokerage that's public in the U.S. Um, traded under Tiger, T-I-G-R, no relationship to the Tiger complex, apparently. It's technical. Its name is Up Fintech. A lot of Chinese retail had stock or was, was shorting through that and had their borrow pulled all of a sudden. And there's a board member from Up Fintech. Uh, well, there's a GSX board member from up FinTech. So I feel like there's kind of an unholy alliance there. But look, I don't know if this conduct rises to the level of illegal. But to me, it seems like there was the, you know, Tung Yue and uh, Bill Huang. There's no way they they didn't know that, that GSX is a fraud. OK, like. There's no fundamental case to be long. I swear to God, there's no fundamental case to have been long this um, at the time they went long. The only reason to go long this is because you think that it's going to go up because of a squeeze. And it seems to me that you'd have to know that a bunch of other people are going to be buying a shit ton of the float around the same time that you do if you're going to make that play. I really want to see this investigated. I don't know that there was illegal conduct. Maybe this is in a gray area, but if it is in a gray area, it's pretty charcoal from what I can see. For people who are watching who can't necessarily tell, that is what Schadenfreude looks like. That uh, that that piece from cut that that smile. That's that's like that's as good as it gets for us short sellers. It's it's not even particularly lucrative for us. It just feels good. I mean, the the pain that like lots of short sellers have felt, not in this name actually, like I think there are many names that it turns out Bill Huang was involved in pulling a similar strategy and whether it was him acting alone, whether it was a 
you know, consortium of funds, whether he's really just a family office, because, you know, the other bizarre thing is he had a website, had recently um, got off of a, uh, a ban that had been imposed on him uh, in relation to some insider trading he did many years ago. Um, it, it really appears, looking at the stock charts of many of these names, that you know, the only thing I can do, Juice, is at some point that really became the strategy for him, whether it's VIP Shop or IQ or Viacom or Discovery or you know, any of the names that he appears to be involved in, they all have a chart that looks, you know, very much like someone has been manipulating the stock. Um, now, the scale of this is is pretty unprecedented in terms of someone vaporizing that much personal wealth. There have obviously been high-profile hedge fund blow-ups in the past, whether it's AMRATH or LTCM. But um, yeah, I think it's quite possible this guy has is, is actually destroyed more personal capital than, than possibly anyone on the planet. Maybe Massa might have had taken a bigger net worth hit from like top to bottom in the dot-com boom. But um, Whatever, they can fight it out between themselves who destroyed more personal capital in, in the blink of an eye. It's, yeah, it's, it's a battle for them to have. Let's talk a little bit about the brokerage uh, lending of credit in this situation. How, how exactly do you get $50 billion of a credit line on total return swap in his position? We think the number, the amount of credit could be a lot higher, actually. Um, we suspect that his capital was much larger than being reported and that he still levered it 5x. It's funny watching the watching the brokers try to downplay it. Uh, Wells Fargo got some blocks to do and that was after at least MS told their uh, clients that there were no more blocks that they were offering. So I kind of wonder if you know you say that to try to calm the market down so it doesn't destroy the va value of the collateral you're trying to unload and then you make that true by having Wells or somebody else do these blocks. But um, we think there could be a lot more uh, there. How you do it? I don't know. I mean, most of the firms that uh, were, you know, were lenders to him have told us they won't do business with us. So I really have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's an interesting question. I think, you know, as this unfolds, we'll find out more what seems to have been the case is that actually he was not on the you know the good boy list for a number of these banks initially and uh, look, we we can't ignore that despite the blow up you know this guy clearly had turned some large sum in, of money into a really large sum of money you can't be a complete idiot to do that. Um, the idea is to keep the money once you turn it into a ginormous sum, but whatever, you've got to be pretty sharp to get there. Um, and so directionally, he must have done some things right with a lot of leverage. I suspect what happened is, you know, if, if his true size is as large as, as we think it might be, he would have been a significant, significant payer for most of the banks. I mean, he could have easily been within the top 10, 20 clients for a large number of these banks, if not, you know, top five client. The way that banks are run, um, you know, if you're the person who is saying no to someone that can pay tens of millions of dollars in brokerage and swap and financing fees a year, that becomes increasingly difficult as all of your peers are doing the same thing. So, I'm sure what eventually happened is the people who were naysayers and said, look, there's a track record for insider trading. There are other problems around this, whether it's the position concentration or leverage. I'm sure those people got pushed to the side. And the people who ran those business units probably thought that they were taking reasonably smart risk or by the time they that this guy blew up. They would be in a seat at another bank getting paid even more for doing such a great job bringing in the business. Um, so I, I'd imagine it was it was somewhat of a, a slow erosion. Um, what is really interesting is the way different banks appear to have dealt with the risk. 
while they may not want to deal with us, and truth be told, not a lot of upside given the way they treat their clients dealing with them. I mean, hats off to Goldman for, for taking the medicine, clearly realizing there was a problem faster than anyone else, um, offering their clients the opportunity to participate in block trades ahead of many other block trades that were likely coming, um, one of the privileges of being a Goldman client. Um, but hats off to them in the way they took the medicine, obviously realized there was a problem very quickly and, and dealt with that to, you know, at least what they've disclosed to be minimal losses. I mean, that is first class in terms of risk management. However, they got to the problem. You know, on Goldman, they retain the, the heavyweight title as being the champion of all prisoners dilemmas. Exactly. For there to be a problem whereby this guy was priming with Wells Fargo, who were not well known to be like significant players in the prime brokerage business, that tells me that Bill Huang had been very smart in looking for leverage anywhere and everywhere that it could be provided. The second thing I find interesting is we don't yet seem to have seen any block sales out of either UBS or Credit Suisse. Um, Credit Suisse have come out and said they have significant exposure. The numbers rumored seem to go up every day. Um, UBS have not yet come out and diagnosed the size of the problem they might or might not have. So if you don't have block sales and you don't have a you know dollar figure around the problem, um, you can only assume that either they have decided this is a great portfolio of names that they want to run. <laughs> Or the, the number is, is very, very large and, um, you know, there's not a lot of upside if you still have massive exposure on your book to broadcasting how big the problem might be. Now, the, the additional issue, I think, will be the reaction to this across the street from Prime. So I think we will likely see Prime's taking a different view to leverage, um, you know, typically regulation and risk management is somewhat more reactive. So if we do see degrossing of more highly levered strategies, which may have been occurring anyway in the light of Melvin and the way that risk was looked at on the short side, if we do see that occurring on the long side of people's books, we could see degrossing across, you know, whether it's the Tiger Complex or just other people who have similar thematic trades on, we could see leverage being taken down across the board, which, if handled in an orderly fashion, doesn't present major risk. But if it's handled in a less than orderly fashion and everyone's racing to get out of the same trades, does present a really interesting problem for the market. We've seen none of that come to pass so far. Do you think that's just a delay or is that just, I guess, it's a non-event and the, the liquidity from the government kind of makes up for that? Seems like the banks, you know, after last Friday anyway, um, seems like the banks are cooperating pretty well and playing it pretty cool, especially if you know, we're correct that there's a lot more in the way of positions that need to be unwound. So if that's if that's true, I mean if we're talking total position unwinds, you know, hundred to one hundred fifty million or billion when all is said and done, so far the banks are doing a great job of playing it cool. I, I'd expect that they won't push their clients to degross until after they've worked through this inventory. So on top of all these things, one of the things that you guys have taught me is that the whole virtue signaling thing is really a, a big factor in finding frauds from, from people. And Bill Huang uh, fronted himself as a, a great Christian um, in a lot of these circles. What do you do on a weekly basis right. to engage in God's word? Yeah, so, uh, so again, knowing that that's how Jesus and God's people mm -hmm. have trained themselves, and then that's how they show his, their love to God. Hey, guys, why do we listen to God? Why? One, because we love him. 
Do you think that had anything to do with the ability for him to lever his fund? I spoke over the summer to an allocator who knows him um, and has has money or has had money in the past with Tung Yue. I was railing about how I think these guys, they must know it's a fraud, um, that you know, what they're doing is at the very least immoral because they're certainly providing a supportive environment and remunerative environment to um, the fraudsters. And the pushback was, well, Bill Huang is, is a fantastic guy and all the causes he's been involved with you know, he's really a stand-up guy. And then I, I said, wait a second, you know, I mean, you know, this, this guy has a, has a real discipline, right? disciplinary track record here. I don't know if the person I was talking to knew that or if it just no longer mattered because of all the wonderful deeds he had done. I mean, certainly dirtbags do tend to cloak themselves overtly in in religion and religious causes. But I think that's also missing a little bit of something here with Bill Huang because some of the causes that he supported, while they are Christian causes, are focus on the family. I mean, and they're, you know, pretty anti-gay, fairly reactionary, you know, hardcore causes. So look, net net, I don't think he was presenting the warmest, fuzziest exterior if you really looked at it. Um, but, you know, I, I am inherently suspicious of somebody who does wear religion on, on his or her sleeve. You know, the website, which has now been taken down, is, you know, it wasn't something I'd visited before, but it, it actually reminded me when you looked at the text and the, you know, the kind of waxing lyrical about efficient markets and kind of tying it into goodness reminded me a lot of B.R. Shetty, who had and probably still has his own website with quotes about how, you know, enrichment is for the goodness of society and all of this that billionaires spew when, you know, people have to listen to them because it's in their interest too. Of all the people I'd say I've come across in the past few years, reading their two websites, like I, I really did kind of draw a little bit of a parallel between the two of them. Going back to the earliest, my earliest days doing this, China Media Express in early 2011. I remember some of the, um, you know, that cacophony that came back at us with no, can't be. He's a devout Buddhist. Did you know what he was doing with the victims of the Sichuan earthquake? Uh, you know, he's a devout Buddhist, you know, and just, you know, A, irrelevant, and B, well, if it's gonna be relevant, probably supports the, the wrongdoing uh, view more than anything else. But yeah, time and time again, people fall for it. And um, one, one of the books that um, I've enjoyed reading, uh, I've read it a couple of times, is a book called Spy the Lie. And it was written by uh, some people who were ex-CIA polygraphers. They've got a firm called QVerity, and we occasionally engage QVerity to review transcripts for us to look for signs of deception. But that's one of their favorites that they cite in the book, um, favorite signs of deception. You know, somebody's accused of, you know, hey, did you steal, you know, so-and-so's wallet? No, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I go to church every Sunday. Look at my trunk. It's filled with Bibles. Like that's, that's a classic way of diverting, trying to divert attention from somebody's wrongdoings is, is religion. So I'm not, yes, I'm an atheist, so I'm kind of talking my spiritual book or lack thereof, but I am inherently skeptical of people um, who really just bang the drum about their you know, faith in X, Y, Z. He's even convinced like Julian Robertson, like everyone in that complex says he's a great guy, which is fascinating for someone who calls bullshit for a living, I think for 30 years in the market, right? Everybody's a great guy till they're not, you know? And I mean, I, I read the, I read the Bloomberg interview with, with Julian Robertson. Um, I, I, he didn't seem just based on what I read, he didn't seem to have that much of be that steeped in the facts. And I think he was relying more on his personal relationship, but that's also the point about con artists. And I'm not saying that Bill Huang is a con artist. Um, I mean, we don't, you know, at least in this case, it's not an it's not an issue um, so far. It seems of him really cheating people, but a lot of I mean, people who do get conned, 
I mean, the way they get conned is they, they have warm personal feelings towards somebody. That's what a good con artist does. Generates warm personal feelings, sense of trust, and then boom, takes your money. And, you know, the people who are bad at it, you know, never make the headlines. The people who are good at it, um, most of them end up in the capital markets. It does smell a, a bit like Bernie Madoff of this cycle. So do you guys think this has more to come? Is this kind of a contagion effect or is this just uh, isolated for now? I really think that does go back to how big the exposure really is across the primes and how reactive they are um, in terms of leverage levels they're allowing other funds to run. Yeah, it, it will be it will be interesting to see. Um, needless to say, um, this is probably his last act, but you know, you, just, you really can never write these guys off. Like, if history's shown us anything, the best way to launch a hedge fund is to blow one the f up in big <laughs> size. Um, if if Merriweather can come back, don't write off Bill Huang. I mean, Merriweather's had what three blowups <laughs> that we know of. Yeah, I mean, well, that includes Solomon. wasn't a hedge fund, but you know, yeah. required it being bailed out. So if Bill Huang is is a true champion, he will have to have four blowups. He's got to take the title. <laughs> All right, Bill, I'm counting on you, buddy. Take that title. Let's uh, let's move on and pivot a little bit and uh, move on to something a little bit uh, less sexy as giant giant leverage and and we'll move on to Kathy Wood and her ETFs. I know Freddie saw some adjustments there. Can you grace us with what Kathy is doing these days? Credit to actually a number of Twitter accounts. Um, I think maybe Stock Jabber and Kubiko who. Um, picked up on some really interesting changes that have happened. So Kathy Wood has, I believe, increased the amount of a uh, percentage of market cap that the ARK uh, Innovation ETF is able to own up to 30%, which is a really significant amount of any company to be owning if you have daily liquidity in your fund. Um, in addition to that, there are actually a number of ARC ETFs that own other ARC ETFs. So this again appears to be another, let's call it an innovation, um, in order to funnel money from one pocket into the other. Um, and then I think, like honestly, the most enjoyable stuff is I've read is is what the space ETF is is actually going to own. Um, one of the companies uh, that was noted was Dianping, the Chinese. Uh, it was either Dianping or Meituan, um, the Chinese Meituan, um, the Chinese uh, sort of like Uber delivery type and a bunch of other businesses bungled together. There does appear to be something called like a, a space pod or, or whatever it is, um, but I, I believe that was just like a, a type of sort of container for food. I think John Deere may have featured as the 12th or 13th largest holding, which again, possible that John Deere do have a secret space program under wraps, but as far as I was aware, they mostly sell tractors. Right, but you will need tractors to create farms when we colonize other planets. So if right. warp drive is done with development, those got your <laughs> tractors are going to be exported throughout the galaxy. <laughs> so, so, you know, why, why is this important other than it seemingly lacking any rational credibility? To me, it's a sign that... You know, there is probably some level of concern about outflows and there is possibly a concern about, you know, either scarcity of awesome opportunities or potentially needing to be able to buy more stocks that you already have significantly concentrated positions in. Now, why I bring that up is, and I'm, I'm not trying to draw a parallel to Neil Woodford because it, it was very different in terms of the levels of concentration he had, but 
towards the end, um, before that really unwound, he started to do things that were, you know, entirely driven by propping up companies he was invested in, whether he was having one fund invest and then another fund invest and then the same fund investing again to mark investments up. Um, he famously moved some of the illiquid companies into a, it was either Guernsey or Jersey kind of OTC type market in order to fudge the definition of what was deemed listed in order to meet certain regulatory requirements. So, you know, I'm not saying that this marks the turning or some sort of spectacular implosion because that, that may not happen, but I think investors do need to be attuned to changes that are being made that possibly allow a manager more flexibility um, when they're painted into a corner because I think it's it's a good sign of possibly what they're thinking one step ahead of you know potential liquidity issues. You know, she said one thing that a few weeks ago when I saw her on CNBC that was kind of interesting. I mean, just for the market past month and a half has been our kind of market, uh, much more so than hers. But she was she was asked about the 10-year treasury and the yield had gone up and I think hit 1.6% um, around the time that she took the interview and tech had been selling off. And she said, well, you know, the 10-year treasury has gone to these levels before, but you know, tech stocks didn't, you know, investors in tech stocks didn't seem to care. Now they suddenly do. Um, or, well, she would actually, I don't think she said that now they suddenly do part. You know, so she was making the point that she's perplexed as to why 10 year yields matter. To these companies that, you know, aren't going to be producing cash flows or like nobody fucking seems to care whether they're ever capable of producing cash flows. And, um, I agree with her. Like, I, I don't know why it suddenly matters. Like why that was the excuse for people to sell these things. Um, but yeah, so I, it's one of these rare moments where I think she actually said something pretty wise. What is interesting is, and we're, we're seeing it a little bit in the SPAC market, the supply of, um, of companies has, has actually increased quite significantly now. I think last time I checked, it was about uh, 80, maybe 90 billion of, um, of SPAC capital that have been IPO'd this year. I don't know if that did or didn't include pipes as well. But, um, you know, if you assume outside of arbitrages and, and hedge funds that are, are playing that game, that is attracting some amount of, you know, the highly speculative capital. You know, I do wonder if similar to 2000, where you just ultimately did have a very large supply of IPOs towards the end, you run into an issue where the money that might have been directed at the hyper growth, more speculative end of the market is being allocated to SPACs. And look, finally, I mean, I think what's very obvious is the next, you know, the next stimulus check was supposed to be a big catalyst for the market. And it looks like that is being spent on just good old fashioned vices, um, you know, up noses, down pioneers being knocked back in flaming Sambucas. And I don't know, you know, as, as someone of, of that generation who, who values experiences, I think that's going to be a better one for most retail investors than when the market turns. So, you know, get out there and spend your stimmy on, uh, on things that are going to give you hangovers and regretful venereal diseases. <laughs> totally agree. Speaking of that rotation, uh, when we get into the capital versus labor dispute, um, meaning now fiscal is really turning up and that money is now going to the hands of a completely different uh, part of the economy. Uh, do you guys see the rotation out of these super high tech uh, narrative uh, stocks and into the value stocks? Will that open up the game for, for activist short selling again? Because just about a month ago, we were talking about Andrew left tapping out of activist short selling. Is there a psychology in activist short selling now that's like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is turning um, now that this is happening. I don't think that 
activist short selling was, you know, was doomed or looked doomed for more than two or three weeks. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic about it. And I don't think you need a rotation into value um, for activist short selling to have, to have a place and to be able to, to do reasonably well. Um, I think the, what we really need is, you know, what we've needed is some appreciation of risk and some discipline in the market. And we're still, I mean, lots of pockets where things are pretty unmoored, but when, you know, when we see things like, you know, Ark and Kathy Wood losing their luster and, you know, this guy who Julian Robertson evidently still thinks is a genius blowing himself up by being, you know, completely idiotic. Um, I think there's an appreciation for risk that's that's coming back into the market. And um, it's interesting because when COVID hit last year and the, and, and the markets froze up, you know, a lot of us who've been skeptics were saying, you know, like, yeah, we told you so, you know, all these years of cheap money, making balance sheets fragile, these chickens have come home to roost. And then... Yeah, we pretty much got you know run over by the party bus that was going 150 miles an hour, and um, you know this is this is a more uh, gradual, I guess, reabsorption of risk by the market, and so maybe it's it's healthier, and it's you know there isn't going to be a party bus that you can just you know jump on and you know uh, drive away with screeching tires in this case because it's more gradual. But I think that that's what's making this a a less hostile environment for, um, for activist short sellers, but you know, there, there are fewer of us, especially because Andrew was, you know, almost like one quarter of them and he's gone. But, um, but for those of us who are left, I, 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 I'm a lot, I'm a lot more positive and optimistic about the environment. You rarely hear me say those things. Um, than I was uh, back in January. Yeah, let's, let's actually just for this one, just just cut that and just run cost and saying I'm positive and optimistic for 45 minutes because I know we've been for a while and struggling to remember the last time I heard those words come out of his mouth. You know what, that's true. Like Tyler said something though there. We could, check, we could chalk it up to satin Freud's a hell of a drug. <laughs> <laughs> and high on satin Freud, man, all weekend. <laughs> You know, so high on it. I'm binging on Chad and Floyd. So maybe in a way, like I'll be more my normal baseline of, you know, usual pessimism and disgruntledism. <laughs> well, you guys deserve it after the past couple of years. But um, yeah, thanks. This has been a hell of an episode. Uh, anything else that we're missing that uh, we should talk about? Dan David. Where is he? He's getting his... Uh... He's in the corner learning how to swear again. He was actually, uh, he was going to refrain from swearing because uh, he, he was planning on just going to Jesus camp for a few weeks. He thought it might help his ability to pick stocks, but um, they lost their that's been kind of... The, the Bill Huang's Jesus camp he's going to. <laughs> well, until next month, guys, this was a pleasure.